This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, company secretaries. Every public company needs one. It was only relatively recently, 2005, that it was a requirement that every company should have a company secretary. But now it's no longer necessary for private companies to have a company secretary. Of course, they can have one if they wish, but there's no statutory requirement for it. So it's now just every, every public company that must have a company secretary. It should be appropriately qualified. This is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. Because, and I'll come down here, because with reference to appropriate qualification, the Act actually spells out what is meant by this expression appropriately qualified. And it turns out that a member of the Associate Institute of Chartered Secretaries, ACIS, Association of Chartered Institute of Secretaries, is the ideal qualification. But of course ACCA is also, and the Chartered Institutes, the Institute of Chartered, the IC. AEW, the Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, and of course the Chartered Accountants of Ireland and of Scotland, they are also appropriately qualified to act as company secretaries. But so too is the uh, Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, they too can be company secretaries, and I believe CAPFA, the Chartered Institute of Public Finance Accountants, as well as the APAA, the Association of Professional Auditors and Accountants. These are all listed out for us, qualified accountants. Then, of course, we've got lawyers, and there's all sorts of different branches of the legal profession. We've got lawyers, barristers, advocates, solicitors, uh, notaries, um, so the justices of the peace would be, yeah, JPs, justices of the peace, um, notary publics, uh, commissioners for oaths, commissioner of oaths, somebody like a notary public. These are all identified as being appropriately qualified to be the um, company secretary of a public company. Then you've got one or two other interesting ones, like um, people who have been company secretary for public company for three of the last five years. And people who were company secretaries of public companies when the uh, new requirement came into force. And then also um, equivalent foreign qualifications. And people who have been more than 20 years, who have been public company secretaries for more than 20 years, can be public company secretaries. And the act goes into this detail. Uh, and it, it says, da, 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 da. and then it says, or anybody that the directors believe is capable. And I think that's brilliant. But personally, I think that is just wonderful. Da, 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 detail, 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 or anybody else that the directors think can do it. They can look at you, they can look at you, they can, directors can say, well, I think you're probably capable of being the company secretary. You may have no qualifications, you may not be, ACIS or ACCA yet. You may not be appropriately foreign qualified or having served as public company secretary for three of the last five years. You may not be any of those, but we believe you can do it. And what's the point? What's the point of specifying all that detail and then just opening the gates and say, well, and, and what happens if you can't do it? We appoint you a company secretary because you're an employee. You're not elected by the members. You're appointed by the directors. So you're appointed as company secretary, and then it turns out that you can't do it. 
And so the directors are then potentially in trouble. Why did you appoint this person? Were they appropriately qualified? Well, they didn't have a qualification, but we believed that they could do it. Ah, oh, come on. It's wonderful, isn't it? English law, I love it. I love it. Duties determined by the directors. Because you're employees, because a company secretary is an employee, the duties of the employee are determined by the directors. But there is a an apparent or ostensible authority imposed upon company secretaries that they have the authority, even though it may not be specified by the directors, they have the authority to enter the company into contracts of an administrative nature. So not buying and selling goods, not by purchasing raw materials and selling finished products. That lies beyond the normal administrative realms of a company secretary. But Ordering a new computer system, or refurbishing the offices, or arranging for the windows to be cleaned, or arranging for the factory to be cleaned, to be swept out on a regular basis. That's what, or arranging for company cars to go and pick up visitors to the company from the airport. That's the sort of thing that a company secretary's normal, apparent, ostensible authority would cover. And it's that last one, this hiring of company cars to meet people at the airport, that landed us in trouble with Panorama Developments and Fidelis Furnishing Fabrics. You do not need to remember the names of these cases. But Panorama Developments was a company secretary who was ordering cars from a car hire firm and using those cars for his own private taxi firm. So he would hire a car in the company's name, get the car, and then in the evenings he'd be driving around that car, picking up fares and, and operating as a taxi company. And then he left the company. At the end of the month, when the bill came, he left the company. And the bill wasn't paid, of course. And eventually the car hire firm contacts uh, Panorama Developments, uh, for, sorry, Fidelis Furnishing Fabrics, and says, where's our money? What money? Well, you owe us for car hire many thousands of pounds. No, we don't. Who's or who authorised that? The company secretary. He had no authority, said the directors. He had no authority to do that. The car hire people said well, he was hiring cars to pick up visitors to the company. So, yes, he did have authority. And the court said, yes, he did have authority. And so the company had to pay. Duties are determined by the register, but typically this is what they have to do. They maintain the company's statutory records. I may have mentioned statutory records in the uh, lecture on promoters on formation, but this is one of the duties of the company secretary, is to maintain those statutory records, unless, of course, the register of members is, is not maintained at the company's registered office, but is maintained at the offices of some other organisation, the offices of the company's registrars, like NatWest Bank registrars. They file returns with the uh, registrar. There are documents that need to be filed. You need to tell the registrar about new debentures, secured debentures. You need to tell the registrar about the appointment or removal of directors or, or a change in auditors. You need to tell the registrar about any special resolutions that have been Past or any special notice of any special resolutions. You need to you need to file the financial statements. So all the time we're filing stuff with the registrar of companies, and that's normally the, reg the, the job of the company secretary to do. They take minutes of meetings. Of course, they do. That's what secretaries do. They take minutes of meetings. Which meetings? Oh, well, obviously the annual general meeting and any other general meeting that the company may hold but also board meetings and class meetings where we have different classes of share and they're having meetings. The company secretary will be there to take the minutes and to type those up and circulate them amongst the people that are entitled to receive a copy of those minutes. So meetings of the non-executive directors, meetings of the audit committee, meetings of meeting, meeting, meetings, the company secretary is there taking minutes of those meetings preparing, typing them, word processing them, distributing them. That's the company secretary's job. It's the company secretary's job to convene the annual general meeting. 
It normally it will say in a set of financial statements at the bottom of the agenda of the notice convening the meeting. It will be signed by the company secretary says, on behalf of the board. And it's the company secretary signs that notice convening the annual general meeting. This is the sort of thing that company secretaries have to do. Ensuring the company complies with statutory requirements, keeping up to date with changes in statute, going on courses, learning about how things are evolving, how requirements are changing. This is again for the company secretary to do. Signing documents as required by law, pretty obvious, and reviewing and amending the confirmation statement, which is sent annually. It used to be an annual return, but instead of acquiring a form for the annual return and completing it and sending it off, what now happens is a confirmation statement. The registrar sends to the company the registrar's records of the company, of the summarised version, and asks the company, will you review this and just confirm for us that it is correct? And so we would review, confirm it, sign it, send it back to the registrar and the registrar. And if it's not, if it needs updating, then we will update it. The company secretary will update it. Underlying principles of corporate governance should also advise that under the, under the principles of corporate governance, the company secretary needs to keep the non-executive directors up to date, needs to uh, arrange any induction course for those non-executive directors. A new non-executive director may know nothing about the company, may know nothing about the products that the company makes, may know nothing about the markets that the company serves, and that's ideal for a non-executive director. They should be totally independent. They come with a, a completely open, fresh mind to assist in the overseeing, the supervision of the non by the non-executives of the activities of the executive board. And the company secretary will need to arrange an induction course uh, to, indu uh, to induce, is, uh, is really to introduce. It introduces these non-executive directors into the uh, environment and says to them, look, these are our customers, these are our supplies, these are products that we make, these are the key personnel that you need to know, here is a list of our subsidiaries and we can go and visit some of the PowerPoint presentation would do it. A PowerPoint presentation prepared, organised by the company secretary. And to enable the company secretary's duties, enable effective communication between the board and its various subcommittees, and between the non-executives and the executives, and if they don't sit together as a, a unicambric board, but they have there's a, a two cambric with the supervisory board and then the executive board, then there needs to be some sort of arrangement of effective communication between the two. That's the company secretary's job. Central registers is also coming into force of the of the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act in 2015, we now have central registers. Private companies can now elect to have as many of their statutory books maintained in the central register. So private companies, it's removing its onerous responsibilities, the burden of statutory record keeping. Private companies are just a small one-man, one-person organisation. It doesn't have to be, it could be many more. But Imagine me setting up my own company, me on my own, one member, one director, one share, that's my company. And I've got to maintain all these statutory records and send off documents to the registrar. Instead of that, I just elect to have all those registers of statutory books maintained by the registrar. And the registrar will send to me annually, will you review and, and make sure and confirm that our records are correct? Much easier, much simpler, much more streamlined, a lot quicker as well, less burdensome. The statutory records, every company is required by law to maintain certain records, the statutory books. They must be kept to the company's registered office unless they're not, if they're kept somewhere else. If they're kept at the offices of the company's registrars, NAT West Registration Department, Lloyds Bank Registration, Halifax Building Society Registration. If they're kept somewhere else, fine. The registered members can be kept somewhere else. And if it is, then certain other registers can follow the registered members. So, for instance, registered dementia holders, 
registered debentures and debenture holders can follow persons with significant control, substantial shareholders. These registers can follow the registered members into the possession of the uh, company's registrars, not the registrar of companies, the company's own registrars. There was a question in the old F4 where you had to write 10 essays with 10 marks each. There was a question that said, identify the, the main statutory books to be maintained by companies and identify and describe the contents of each. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. For 10 marks, you had to identify the main statutory records and describe their contents. Give over. Well, those are the, those are the registers. Those are the registers, the statutory books. There's also the minute book as well as that's not been included in there. The minute book is a requirement to be kept. And then describe the contents of each, and all this had to be done in 18 minutes? You're joking. The answer when it came out suggested that the main records were simply the register of members and the register of directors. And the register of members, even this is an onerous responsibility. We need to, to know. We need an index. We need the name of each member, their residential address, the date that they became a member, and the date they left, because we don't tear the sheets out, the date they left will also have to be kept, the shares held, from what date, Sales and purchases of shares, amounts paid, transmission of shares rather than sales or purchase, the class of share, <laughs> describe the contents of each, identify the main registers and describe the contents of each. Come on, this is a ridiculous question. It's, a, it's an unbelievably stupid question. For the F4 examiner to have asked that in the past, and they did, then that's a ridiculous thing to expect. He only expected those two. But even so, the directors, the contents are similar. Names, full names, na nationality, nationality of origin is different. Surname, Christian forename. Any former names given up, any former former names given up, uh, except those given up for more than 20 years and the maiden name of married women and the commoner's name of the law of any peer of the realm and their residential address and the other directorships and you have to list them. Heaven's sakes, no. Too much, too much. We're looking at persons of significant control. People are satisfied of the following criteria of persons of significant control. More than 25% of the company's shares, more than 25% of the voting rights. If they have the right to appoint and remove a majority of the company's board of directors, even though they may not have any shares at all. Imagine that. So we can cover it the same as this. Imagine that we've got two directors, A and B, and the company's in trouble, wants to borrow some money, so they approach a lender. They approach C. And they say to C, will you lend us some money, a lot of money? And C says, yes, I'll lend you a lot of money, but I want to secure, I want some sort of uh, control over my land. So I want to appoint directors and A and B. said, yes, you can appoint a director. And C said, no, 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 I want to appoint three directors. I want to appoint D, E, and F. So now there are five directors, and three of them are controlled by C. If you have the power to appoint a majority of the board to control the board, then you are a person with significant control, even though you may hold not a single share. These two hold 100% of the shares, but he, she, controls the activities of the company because they control the board of directors. And finally, is where a trust can exercise significant control 
and there is a person that can exercise significant control over the trust, then that person is a person of significant control. We move on into auditors. Again, required unless small, small companies don't need auditors. Private companies don't need auditors, which is uh, fine, except it rather hurt the income for the small firms of auditors that used to audit the small companies, the small clients. The big audit firms are not probably bothered about looking after the smaller clients. They, they're interested in, in mega fees. They're not interested in a hundred pound here and even a thousand pound there. They're looking at the big style. So the small companies used to have to have small firms to audit their books. But now small companies, typically private, no longer need to have an audit. Who appoints auditors? You're going to say the members do. Well, that's not strictly so. It's not a complete list. There's actually one missing off this list. The first auditors are appointed or approached by the promoter. So the promoter will, will identify a firm to act as auditor. And they get named on this documents going off for registration. But if the promoter does it, then the first directors will appoint the first auditors. And so along come the directors and they appoint the first firm of auditors. The directors also appoint firms where there is a casual vacancy. There's one AGM and there's the next AGM and an audit, auditor holds office from the end of that one to the end of that one and then if they are re-elected in this one then they'll hold it for another year and hold it for another year and hold and so on but every now and then there is a casual vacancy Every now and then, between annual general meetings, say there, an auditor becomes disqualified. An auditor dies or resigns or is removed by resolution of the members. So suddenly we have no auditor filling the position. There is no person or firm filling the position of auditor. And that then creates a casual vacancy. And that casual vacancy needs to be filled. Well, instead of calling another general meeting of shareholders where we just had one and we appointed the auditors there and they chose then to be removed or they chose to, to resign part way through the, the next month, it's a lot of expense to call a meeting of members. So instead the directors have the power to appoint a firm of auditors to fill a casual vacancy. And that firm at the next AGM, they must resign and be re-elected by special notice of ordinary resolution. So it's not just a question of let's appoint some, then let them resign or, or die or become bankrupt or become disqualified. Let, and, and then the directors can appoint their own choice and that own choice can then go on and on and on. No, no, no. That, that casual vacancy filler must be reappointed at the next annual general meeting by ordinary resolution with special notice. Members, they were the ones who, they will elect here. Even if it's an ordinary resolution with special notice, the members will elect subsequent auditors. They also have the power to fill that vacancy there that arose. The directors may, if it doesn't happen there, if it happens there instead, then the directors may say, well, it's worthwhile getting the members meeting in order to fill the casual vacancy. So members will appoint subsequent annual reappointments uh, and also have the power to fill casual vacancies. And if no one else does, then the Secretary of State will be told that we couldn't agree on who to get or the members couldn't uh, identify or we couldn't find a firm which was willing to stand. Sometimes there are companies whose activities are so not necessarily antisocial, but so emotive and stir up so much trouble, like animal testing companies, companies that do laboratory tests on live animals. There aren't many firms of auditors that will be prepared to risk the damage to their reputation were the animal activists to find out that, that KPMG are the auditors of, I don't know if they are, so please don't quote me on that. Uh, KPMG's reputation could take a real beating and so could their premises because the animal rights activist movement 
can get very belligerent and very antagonistic, very, very forceful. So if nobody else is prepared to act, the Secretary of State will put somebody in. I imagine, although I have never read, I imagine that there should also be included here the court. The court has the power to do anything it wants, so long as it's legal. The court, in my uneducated, um, not knowing, I'm not 100% certain, but I imagine that the court has got the power to appoint auditors. That's just a, I've never said that ever, never, ever, ever. In years of lecturing have I said that the court can appoint auditors, but I bet they can. Auditors must be appropriately qualified. That's what you're going to be. You're going to be appropriately qualified when you become a CCA. It can't be. You can't be a director or an employee of the company because you're not a pre you're no longer independent, are you? An auditor is an independent. It expresses an independent view. And if you're a director or employee, you're not independent. But here's an end. You, all right, you can't be a partner or employee of a director or an employee. But there's nothing to say that the employer of a director shall be excluded. That apparently is allowed, which is a little bit amazing. It's, I think it's a technical anomaly within legislation, but it is apparently allowed that a, a person who is the employer of a director is also not disqualified from being that director's company's auditor, which is, which is an interesting concept. But it's unlikely because of the next thing, because of professional rules. Professionally, you'd be prevented from owning a beneficial interest or being directly related with either a company's officer or an employee, a senior employee. Um, so professional rules would prevent that employer-director situation from arising. Okay, and then finally we've got auditors' rights and duties. The rights, duties and access to company's records. All the records of the company should be within the reach and the availability of the auditor. And there is a, uh, an exam question, I think it's a P7 audit question, where the examiner says that um, shortly after the first morning, um, the uh, finance director rushed into the audit room with the book under his arm and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've given you the wrong cash book. This is, this is the right one. Well, whoa, alarm bells here. They're keeping two separate cash books, one for the auditors and one for reality. One for the auditors, stroke, taxman, stroke, batman, and uh, another record for keeping a track on how well they are actually doing. So auditors are entitled to access to all the company's records. And that's incidentally, that's a, um, a matter for uh, reporting by exception, down at the bottom of the, the notes there, reporting by exception, if um, proper accounting records are not kept, or if not all information and explanations have been received by the auditor. Um, where did it say information and explanations? Now, if they don't receive all information and explanations, then they would qualify their opinion, by exception. They don't have to say, and we have received all information and explanations, but if they don't receive all information and explanations, then they would qualify their audit opinion accordingly. Notice of an attendance at companies' general meetings. Not only can they attend, they can speak and be heard. They have the right to attend, speak and be heard at any general meeting of the company's members. So where the secretary sends out notice and says, notice is hereby given that a meeting is to be held of members, at such and such a date, such and such a place, such and such a time, the auditor is entitled not only to receive notice, but also to attend those meetings. Attend, speak and be heard on matters that concern him, her, as auditor. Written representations. If the audit is proposed to be removed, then notice has to be given, special notice has to be given, 28 days notice has to be given to the auditor. 
in order that the auditor has the right to make written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. Defamatory. Nasty, bitter, twisted. I'm glad you proposed that I should be removed because I'm fed up of working with this bunch of monkeys that you call directors. No offence, monkeys. So that would be defamatory, that would be nastiness. And you're not allowed as an auditor to be nice. You've got to be professional, basically. So what you do write in your written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature is you write any justification that you feel why the members should not remove you from the office of auditor. You believe that the directors are... Um, acting out of a personal dislike for you for no reason at all. You believe that you are probably the best person firm available to make sure that your directors uh, seem to be progressing the company in a logical, controlled, steady manner. Um, so defending your corner, really. If somebody has proposed that you be removed, probably the directors, but maybe an, an, an aggrieved member or group of members, and you're saying, well, look, you're mistaken. You should not be removing me. You should, in, uh, in contrast, you should be encouraging me, hoping that I will be re-elected at the next general meeting. So those are written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature, and it's a right of the auditor to have those written representations. Now, just before I move on to the last one, remember I, I drew the timeline of, of an AGM and then another AGM. An auditor is elected at the end from, to take effect from the end of that one to the end of that one. But if an auditor is removed there, if an auditor is, is removed from office between AGMs by members in meetings, if an auditor is, is booted out, then they can make these written representations of reasonable length. And they can, they can have those written representations circulated in advance, 21 days notice in advance of the, the meeting that is held to remove them. So 28 days before, Notice is sent to the auditor. Seven days later, the auditor submits the written representations. These are circulated, 21 days notice. There's the meeting held to remove the auditor. The auditor can attend, speak and be heard at that meeting. And they, he has to be given the opportunity to defend his corner. He can either speak off the cuff or he can read out his representations but he has the right to communicate directly with the, the members of the company. It's the only time the auditor does have that right, is in general meetings. Not only that, but if there's another meeting there to appoint a replacement auditor, our original auditor can attend that meeting as well, and can attend, speak and be heard at that meeting. Not only that, but when this guy is reappointed there at the AGM, our original auditor can attend, speak and be heard at that one as well. So he's got, not only, not only was he appointed there and removed there, but he can have, uh, attend that one where they were replacing him and he can attend that one where he would otherwise in the ordinary course of events have retired at the end of his year of office. Receive copies of proposed written resolutions. Well, this is an unusual, and I imagine it's a very, very rare circumstance. Written resolutions are available only for private companies. I've just said at the top here, that, at the, the top of the previous page, that, that um, private companies don't need auditors. So it will be an unusual combination for a private company to have an auditor and the private company to want to prepare a written resolution. But they can happen. And if the private company does have an auditor and it wants to pass a resolution as a written resolution, they have to show the auditor first. Because that written resolution may be proposing the removal of the auditor and the auditor has got the right 
to make written representations of reasonable length and not defamatory in nature. I didn't mention reasonable length, not exceeding 1,000 words. Duties, the duties of auditors is to express an opinion on the truth and fairness of the view shown by or of the presentation of the view shown by the financial statements. And they express in their opinion, and it says in our opinion. And then there's the basis of the opinion, how it was, what background did they do in order to reach that opinion. So in their opinion, their, the, the financial statements do or do not show a true and fair view, maybe with the exception of, so it may be a qualified opinion. It may be that their opinion is not totally clean. It, it's not an opinion that says, oh yeah, we're really happy with these financial statements. The financials, in our opinion, financial statements do show a true and fair view. It may be that the auditor's just a little bit concerned about maybe a little bit of those financial statements, or maybe a lot of those financial statements. But nevertheless, it is the auditor's responsibility, their duty, to express an opinion. There is a, an interesting one. There is a possibility that if the uh, unavailability of appropriate information, an insufficiency of appropriate information is apparent, and if that uh, relates to a lot of the, the financial statements, an inadequacy of appropriate, sufficient information. If that's the situation, the auditor may feel that the financial statements could have been written by Hans Christian Andersen, the, the storyteller, the, the fairy tale teller. Who, who can tell? There is an insufficiency of evidence available to us. And in that situation, this is something you'll come across in F8 and in P7. In that situation, the auditors have got the opportunity to disclaim their opinion. Because of the nature of the uh, uncertainties surrounding the, the environment, surrounding our work, we are unable to express an opinion. But it's their statutory duty to express an opinion. So the audit profession took this to court to say to legal opinion. And the legal opinion said, an opinion that says it's unable to express an opinion is an opinion in itself. So the fact that the auditors say, because of the nature of the uncertainties, we are unable to express an opinion is apparently satisfying their statutory duty that they have to express an opinion. Reports of the director's report is inconsistent or misleading. It's not within the normal audit opinion, but the auditor have to review the director's report within a set of financial statements. And if the auditors discover something there which is misleading or which is inconsistent with anything within the financial statements that the auditor is reporting on, then the auditor must include that within their own audit report. For quoted companies, we've also got to re report on certain elements of director's remuneration. And that, that, that information within the financial statements has to be right. Not right to the nearest thousand, not right to the nearest hundred, not even right to the nearest ten pounds. It has to be right to the nearest pound. And if it's not right, then the auditors will uh, qualify their opinion. Material, yes it is. It is qualitatively material. It's not quantitatively material, but it is quality and qualitative, qualitative material, and therefore the auditor will report on it, will qualify their report, qualify their opinion. Auditors should sign and date the audit report, of course, and report by exception if proper accounting records have not been maintained. And that's it for auditors. That's all you should need to know about auditors when doing the F4 exam. So lectures now finished.